Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range tactical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Well, midday temperatures today are soaring again. We can see from the Central Valley of California into the Central Plains and Southern Plains of the United States, we have a lot of, of heat here. Uh, we're soaring back up in the Southwest into the uh, triple digits here, and we're expecting those temperatures temperatures to top out around 110 today. Uh, so we got quite a bit of heat and some of the bigger questions are going to be answering in this video is what does that long term temperature forecast look like as we begin to finish uh, the forecasting for June and, and then get into to the month of July. So we're going to get to that in just a few seconds here. Just a couple things I want to point out. Last night's severe weather which went right through this section of the country. Uh, we're watching it very closely today as the outflow from those thunderstorms moves south and you can see Storm Prediction Center's midday outlook has a wide sector here in the United States that's on the uh, lookout for later on this afternoon and this evening for some strong to severe storms. If anything, just to let those folks in Iowa and Illinois know, we have pushed this boundary farther to the south as we've seen the outflow move a little bit farther to the south. So watch out for those severe stunt thunderstorms uh, later on today. How much rain did we get? Well, you can see here some of the storms put down quite a bit of heavy rainfall, especially in parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, eastern Iowa, and sections of northern Illinois. And then surrounding that, you, know, you can see some locally heavy rainfall parts of the northeast and even here in the high plains. Uh, so this has been, um, last 24 hours, pretty stormy for some folks around the country, while a wide swath of us missed out on a lot of the most recent rainfall. Now, speaking of rainfall, I want to discuss this map as a setup. Going back over the last couple of weeks, we can find out here where things have been drier than normal and things have been wetter. With the widely scattered storms in this sector, we can clearly see that there are places there in the midsection of the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley that have missed out on some of the recent thunderstorm activity. In fact, we were watching some planters roll over near Springfield, Illinois, which is right in through here, which was having its wettest year on record, uh, then go over to dry, and the planters were throwing up quite a bit of dust. Uh, con of concern to me is what's going on here in uh, parts of the Northern Plains in Minnesota. Uh, we're going to see here in the near term quite a bit of precipitation coming through that area. And what's interesting is that over the last 14 days, we have really put down some pretty heavy rainfall in places here where we've been concerned about drought development. So something at least to kind of keep perspective on as we move forward in the central part of the United States. Now, over the next week, uh, this map in the background here shows you total accumulated precipitation. But I want to make something uh, all of you aware of something. We've been covering the near-term severe weather threat. But just to point things out, as we work our way into the day on Saturday and then into the day on Sunday, our day four and day five forecast here, uh, we do need to be watching the northern plains for some severe weather. Now let me go ahead and take those drawings off there and remove those uh, images so you can see what's going on in the background here. This is the week one total accumulated precipitation from the WPC and there's a few things I want to point out. Uh, due to the upper level flow pattern sweeping through the Pacific Northwest, which is really going to cause a major temperature change, we are going to be watching from the Canadian prairies into the north central United States for the potential for grabbing quite a bit of rainfall. Uh, I put a couple of contours on this. I hope you guys like it. And the first contour here is always going to be the half degree, or excuse me, half inch contour. And I put a one and a half inch contour on this as well so we can kind of see where the heaviest rains are going to be. And clearly we're bringing in some rain on some dry ground, which I just showed you a few mo moments ago. But the big question remains is where is Tropical Storm Cristobal going to go? And are we going to be seeing a path that takes it through Louisiana, Arkansas, up into Missouri and Illinois? And how much rainfall spreads to the east of this as well? So comparing that previous map to what is normal, this is what our precipitation map looks like. So from Texas through parts of uh, Kansas, this upcoming week is relatively dry. And uh, you can also see in parts of Michigan getting to the northeast dry. And here over the southeast where higher pressure is going to sit is going to be relatively dry. But outside of that, much of the rest of the country is seeing wetter than average conditions. That even includes some more monsoonal like thunderstorms down here uh, over parts of the southwest. Very hit or miss, but they're down there. So update on Cristobal here. We can see that the major changes in the models weren't really coming from the European. It's kind of always had this path taking it somewhere toward Louisiana, maybe Louisiana, Texas border. Uh, this morning's updates from uh, the National Hurricane Center following a very similar trajectory and even their one o'clock update, which just came out the moment I started recording this, was very similar. Uh, but just to show you, the GFS really kind of backed off and brought the storm system back to the west recently. But it does suggest that this track could possibly go over toward the Ohio Valley rather than up into the central Mississippi uh, Valley, which is what the European says, as you see right through here. So we've got some things to watch, but this is, remember, still five or six days away from getting close to the shore. That 120 there means 120 hours from this morning on when it's going to make landfall. So that's, that's five days. So we've got a lot to be watching here with this particular system. 
Now, the upper level flow pattern is what I really want to be discussing with you because even though we saw an omega pattern develop in the North Atlantic and it seems to kind of persist, it doesn't really block everything up. And as you watch this animation play forward, what you notice here is that, well, I'll just watch it again, sweeping throughout the United States through much of North America, we have a pattern that just brings in ridges and then they're followed by troughs. In fact, if you start counting the number of waves in the pattern, I count pretty much through the next 15 days, at least a four wave pattern, sometimes it's even five. And overall, that means that the pattern's kind of resisting blocking. But I'm gonna take you straight into the long range here. Let's go out from the GFS on the left, European on the right to day 10. Now there's a few subtle differences here. Notice the trajectory of the troughs in the GFS. I'll draw a line through the main trough axis here. The European has it back up like this. So what we end up having is a positive tilt in the European and a negative tilt in the GFS. Now, why is that important? The difference will be what happens here in the Canadian prairies in the north central United States under this ridge. With the troughs sweeping around in the GFS, we're going to bring in moisture with this and really light this area up with severe weather. With the European having this positive tilt to it, this is actually a drier pattern in the central United States. It's pretty subtle, but that's really what it is. And really quickly before I show show you that going out longer term, we still see the GFS having a much deeper trough west and east, whereas the Europeans just a bit flatter with it. And this could be because we're averaging in more ensemble members, but look at the differences in the week two precipitation. The GFS, again, keeps much of the northern plains of the United States and the Canadian prairies uh, on the wetter side of things, whereas the uh, European has actually has that same area over on a slight dry bias. The Europeans wanting to favor the wetter conditions along the East Coast, which you can still see here in the GFS, but not quite as pronounced as the European. And all of them are trying to keep, you know, a section of Texas, maybe over toward the Delta, dry. But remember, it's that time of year where we have tropical systems coming through. And look at the difference between what the GFS sees and the European. So predictability out at week two right now and precipitation is quite low. And I want you to remember that as we go through the rest of this video. On to temperatures now. Great agreement between the models over the next five days. That heat is on for another five days in the midsection of the United States and not going anywhere. But we notice that the pattern breaks down once we get out into the six to 10 day time frame, And that is where that broader trough comes in and pushes that ridge off to the east. And we see it in both models. Now, the mid-month, you know, I say cool down, but the mid-month return to normal temperatures in the United States, well, because the pattern stays open and keeps going, we start to see some heat kind of rebounding back into this area, as you can see here in both models. So we seem to be on this unblocked, open wave pattern that, that's moving. And our most important question that I could even ask and attempt to answer is, does that end? Because if that ends... That could give us an entirely different pattern for the end of June and the beginning of July. And that's when you start to perk up and we start to worry about those things. So let's just look at what the models say first. Now, this is from the CFS V2. In my opinion, it's not as reliable of a long range forecasting model. I, my, I think it needs improvement. But precipitations on the left, it's got this area wet for week three and week four drier in the northwest, drier in the Canadian prairies. In terms of temperatures over there on the right, it wants heat up the west coast for week three and week four, and near average to even cooler than average weather in the central plains all the way over to the midwest and even extending to the east coast. So it's saying, hey, when you bring in the cooler weather mid-month, just leave it around and don't get rid of it because this goes all the way out to June 30th. So that's the CFS V2. What about the European model? Well, what we're looking at here at the same time periods, so week three is on top and week four is on bottom. Precip is left, temperatures are right. Now we know that the European model, once it's initialized, it tends to carry the pattern forward quite well. In other words, it doesn't break away from what it's initialized with. But to say that we're gonna be seeing a warm remainder of June, I think is much more in the cards than what you saw the CFS V2 painting. I think our chances of finishing the month, uh, I know most of the months ahead of us, but finishing it mostly with a warm bias is certainly the case. What I'm concerned about is the precipitation kind of flip-flop. Uh, drier than normal conditions, well, we see the models are keeping wet north and near average to drier than average across a big section of the U.S. until we get into week four, and it wants to then bring in quite a bit of wet weather. So the models at this point are kind of giving us, well, I'll be honest, um, if, if either model verifies, 
I don't have anything right now that throws up a red flag that says drought's going to spread, extreme heat's going to be a problem if you're east of the Rocky Mountains. I don't like how hot it is west of the Rocky Mountains because it's normally the dry season there and we crank up the temperatures here, we're going to be really seeing high evapotranspiration rates. And that's something that we have to just contend with with our irrigation efforts and it could eventually lead toward you know, shrubbery, vegetation, the grass is drying out and increasing our fire threat later. So this is what I want to do to finish this video. I'm going to ask myself a question and I'm going to try as hard as I possibly can not to confirm my own biases. That's a challenge in atmospheric sciences when we forecast. So the question I'm going to ask is, what would it take for the models to be wrong such that heat and dry weather return at the end of June and persist into July, especially in the central plains for pollination? Okay. Now, my theory up to this point, this is the bias I am attempting to not confirm, is that I don't think we're in for long duration extreme heat this summer across any section of the United States east of the Rockies. I think it's a higher probability in California, Oregon, and Washington. I don't see widespread drought developing, and I'm trying to keep my confirming bias tendencies away from this. I will say any ill-timed heat and drought, especially flash drought, needs to be forecasted, but that's every year. So if we're gonna see heat and drought develop from the Central Plains to the Midwest, to the southeast. These two main bullet points are things that have to happen. The jet stream's got to do this. Slow it down, move it north. If you do that, the heat comes with it. Ridge out over the Aleutian Islands. Trough in the west that puts a ridge in the central United States and the trough over the eastern Greenland. If that happens, the pattern slows down, blocks up for a while, and we get into some serious heat. Secondly, now a set of things happen in the tropics and in the global winds. Crank up the trade winds. Get La Nina going. Stop the MJO from moving. Slow down our global atmospheric angular momentum. And we're going to watch what has to happen in the quasi biennial oscillation. So you ready? First things first, I'm going to talk MJO. The MJO has been on the move. It has really been cranking along just fine. It's right now sitting over in phase one, which phase one is both here and here. Okay. If it stays here and doesn't continue to move around, that concerns me that the tropics are not going to be transporting momentum like they normally do into the subtropics, which is helping keeping the jet stream going. Okay, some, For some reason, we at least think over the next 15 days, it's not necessarily moving at the pace we want it to move. What's interesting is that would break the longer term trend. So I know the map over there on the right for many of you watching is not something you like to look at, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. What I'm doing is I'm highlighting where the upper level winds were conducive to allowing upper level divergence. And then I'll put in dash lines here where they were sinking and causing things to get um, hotter and drier. Now up until this point, the MJO has been moving. It's had a hard time getting into the Western Hemisphere, but it's at least been moving. So at this point, all eyes need to be right here over the next 15 days to see if the MJO can come out of phase one, two and actually just keep going around. And if it keeps going around, that's one positive signal that says, hey, the chances of July getting stuck and blocked and super hot and dry is minimized. Secondly, now let's get kind of deep and nerdy here with this, but let's go looking way up high in the atmosphere where the pressure is about 30 to 50 millibars. That's something called the QBO. Now the quasi-biennial oscillation, what I'm watching for is the fact that since uh, the beginning of the year, so right about here, all right, the values have been dropping off. Now they they're in this normal oscillation where the westward winds kind of propagate downward and they're replaced by easterly winds at that level. And that's what that figure over there on the left is trying to explain. Now, if you can, please focus right down here with me for a moment. Because what we've seen since 2018 are these westerly winds descending like this. All right. Now they should be, not should be, but normally they're replaced with easterly winds that descend for a little while before westerly winds come back in again. And we can kind of watch this, this biennial oscillation, uh, meaning it happens over multiple years, uh, evolve. What I'm concerned about is the fact that right now at the very end of this, here we are in, in June, we do not see the strong easterlies returning. Okay, so in other words, it doesn't look like this or like this. You can kind of see these other years where those easterlies made a strong return. We're not seeing that necessarily. And instead, we might be getting another little bit of a westerly burst at this level. We can see that the westerly winds have come all the way down here into, well, 100 to 300 millibars is the top of the troposphere. And what I'm looking at here is there's some odd similarities between this and 2016. In fact, if I get all those drawings off there and you go look, look right here now, and right here back in 2016. 
Now, if the westerly winds emerge again like they did in 2016, that gives us more reason to think that 2016 is a good analog to this. But my main point is that right now, the average wind speed at these levels is technically negative. And what that tends to do when you look at the correlation of that, we'll look at the map down there at the bottom. It tends to mean more ridges out west and more troughs here and here. And if that pattern was the most dominant thing, then I would tell you that if you're east of the Rockies, we're going to have a cool, uh, excuse me, we're going to have a wet, but probably hot summer. If you are in the west, it's going to be hot and dry. That would be what I would tend to say out of this pattern. So that's my analysis of the QBO. What about uh, the trade winds? What about La Nina? What about ocean temperatures? Well, there's been a lot of cloud cover up here lately. And we've seen a cooling trend happening in the North uh, Pacific Ocean. But there's been a lot of, well, not so much cloud cover down here. And temperatures have been warming on the ocean surface. And because of a big westerly wind burst lately, and still some stronger trade winds over here. Far, sorry, let me get those drawings up there. Westerly wind bursts, but some still stronger trade winds here. We've actually seen our ocean temperatures in the center Pacific kind of bounce off of a floor here and start to rise a little bit. Now they're going to do that. But I do see trade winds strengthening again with time. So this La Nina event, this weak La Nina event, is still on. But it doesn't extend into the North Pacific. So as I finish this up, I come back to some ideas I proposed in the last few videos. Now this is for the Corn Belt, all right? But it pertains to the rest of the country. During years where I had really wet April, May, and Junes, what years then trended to really hot and dry July, August, September? Those are the ones that go upward, the solid black lines on this. And I pulled out those years and I made a few composite maps. I'm going to show them to you again. Those years in June, the jet stream tended to favor this. Okay, look at that southwest flow. That was why it was wet in spring. But then by the time we got into June, July, August, the jet stream instead troughed west ridged over the Great Lakes and that ridge right into there is what took us over to hot and dry and you can see the years right there those are the years and if you read through some of those years you're gonna remember some some nasty ones there for the midsection of the country so here's what I want to show you in the month of July if we look in the mid levels of the atmosphere what's the average wind speed well we can see that they're fast in through here and fast in through there okay for those years where we had Julys that were hot and dry, this is what the wind speeds did. Now look, I'll go back and forth. Normal during those hot, dry Julys. The winds here and here really slowed down. And the jet stream not only moved north, okay, it moved north, it also, uh, with it, ridged out like this across the midsection of the country. That would be what I'd have to watch. I'd want to see winds in the Central Pacific and in, excuse me, in the North Central Pacific and in the North Central Atlantic slow down dramatically if I was going to call for a hot and dry July. What's going on right now? Well, this is through day 10. You're looking at 500 millibar wind speed anomalies. I see them fast here and fast there and even fast here. What about all the way up to day 15? Still see them faster than normal. This is part of the reason why the middle of this month is not showing up as hot. The jet stream is right where it should be. It's not north, and the winds are fast. So that's part of it, okay? But if we are going to have a problem, this is where I think it's going to be. I've been saying this for a while. We have to watch the global atmospheric angular momentum, specifically the northern hemisphere. Because if these winds, like they did last July, come crashing down here, then that's signaling that the jet stream in the Pacific and in the Atlantic is just slowing down, moving north. And if it does that, it blocks up. The wave pattern gets long and we get hot and dry. That is the big if in this forecast. And forecasting the position of this out two, three, four weeks is very, very hard. In fact, I just watched a talk this morning put on by NOAA. Uh, it's part of the reason why the video is coming out to you in the middle of the afternoon. I wanted to watch that talk. And the number one thing that the speaker said was that more research needs to go into us understanding what the global atmospheric angular momentum really represents because it has some very strong ties to subseasonal forecasting. I'll finish with one last map. We at least know right now that our drought is confined and has been confined there. The western drought has not changed much. This drought here, I'm hoping to change dramatically in the coming weeks or next week. And this might be worked on hard by our tropical system coming up like that. So let's keep an eye on all of it. 
watch it together. Hope you found this useful and informative, but I'll talk to you again tomorrow morning, okay? Have a good one. Thank you.